The rural farming villages of northern Germany are beautiful, but remote. So remote, telecom companies refused to install modern broadband connections because they didn't see any profit in it. Being connected to the world is very important to the future of our community. We are very spread out here. For some properties, the nearest neighbour can be up to six kilometres away. Snubbed by the telecom providers, the village of Löwenstedt have taken matters into their own hands. This is a long-term project. We don't expect to make any money for around 30 years. That's not interesting to a big company. We're doing this for the service, not profit. They've installed 22 kilometres of fibre optic cable, creating a community-built broadband network that connects each household. For anybody not convinced, the local restaurant also doubles up as a showroom, so people can see just how big the differences are before and after the switch over to fibre optics. But it doesn't come cheap. It costs €1,000 to join up, and for that each person becomes a shareholder in the company. Despite the cost, there's been good uptake. Over 90% of the village is now part of the network, and it's helping families keep in touch. My son studies computer science and has to spend most of his time in the city. Because of this, he can come home and work here sometimes. It's great to see him. The broadband access has changed the way business is done, allowing this farmer to sit on his porch while still controlling and monitoring his biogas plant, which generates power for the village. Even the cows are online, tagged and logged with a click of a button. Here, going head to head with the main providers has paid off for the community. Peter Oliver, RT. Hi there, I'm Darren Howard. And I'm Robert Nisbet. A positive show because we've been doing stuff that's been so shocking lately. Yeah, I know, I get tired of talking about all the dark things that are going on in the world. You know, a, 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 you know, a small German town that's overlooked by the internet providers because it's just not profitable. Well, way to go, guys. Big thumbs up. Put in your own fiber optic network because you need to be on, on the grid. We're talking about positivity right now. Things that are going right, right here. Let's take a look at a drinkable book. Yeah, because you know, water contamination is a huge issue. Check this out. 3.4 million people die each year from water-related disease. But the even bigger problem? Most of them don't even know their water is unsafe to drink in the first place. That's why Water is Life, partnering with scientists and engineers at Carnegie Mellon and the University of Virginia, set out to invent a solution that solves both of these problems. Introducing the Drinkable Book, the first ever tool that teaches safe water habits and is printed on technologically advanced filter paper capable of killing deadly waterborne diseases. The book uses a brand new type of paper that works like a scientific coffee filter. Each piece is coated with silver nanoparticles, which kill diseases like cholera, E. coli, and typhoid. The orange color of the paper is a direct result of the addition of the silver nanoparticles. And at the end of the day, the most important thing, and really the hero of this whole project, is the technology behind it. The book itself works in three easy steps. Simply tear out a filter, slide it into the custom filter box, and pour contaminated water through. What comes out is safe to drink. The content on each page, printed in food grade ink, educates people about safe water habits, things that we take for granted, such as keeping trash and feces away from your water source. But the best part of the book isn't just that it purifies water or teaches proper sanitation, it's the fact that this filter paper will revolutionize water purification. It costs only pennies to produce, making it by far the cheapest option on the market, and it's extremely sustainable. Each filter is capable of giving someone up to 30 days worth of clean water, and each book is capable of providing someone with clean water for up to four years. To learn how you can provide a filter book for a community in need, head to waterislife.com. So a drinkable book, of course, you know, Senator Duffy probably isn't going to get the right things out of it, but, you know, we're kind of thinking that it's a good thing. Uh, there are solutions, okay? This is the major thing. Banks and government are just not interested in the solutions that we find on the Internet. No, it's people that step up and make the real difference. And there were people in Kimberley that stood up and made a difference. Instead of spending millions of dollars on turning themselves into some tourism prostitute... They decided to get to work. Yeah, and go renewable. Did you see how they was kind of slamming the local government with that? Oh, I like the way you did that. Kimberly, check this out. 
the sun is almost always shining over Kimberly, which makes a great backdrop for a groundbreaking, especially if it's for a massive solar power project. It's uh, the foot in the door kind of uh, project for the solar industry. It's an opportunity for the solar industry to show what, what it can do. The Sun Mine is being built at the Sullivan Mine site, at one time the country's largest underground mine. It closed in 2001, but left behind an industrial brownfield and eliminated Kimberley's major employer. So the city was keen to support new development, and it turns out residents were too. Three years ago, in a referendum, they voted overwhelmingly to borrow $2 million for the solar project. You don't typically see that for referendums that involve money. And so that I took that away as a statement that the community was committed to seeing this happen. This is an idea of what it will look like when construction is complete. The anticipated start date of operation is January. The 4,000 solar cell modules will be mounted on trackers to follow the sun's path and produce 1.05 megawatts of power. That power will go into the BC hydro grid. We know what's happening. We know climate change. We know, you know, the damage that coal uh, can make. And if we can produce electricity in different ways, I think that's uh, good for the planet and good for everybody. The province and tech contributed an additional $3 million, but Sun Mine will be community-owned, so the city will benefit from the revenues. While alchemists could never figure out the formula to turn lead into gold, they could say that's finally about to happen here at the old Sullivan Mine. Elaine Yong, Global News. So right here at town, we wasted $100 million doing nothing to create jobs for the local people. But of course in Kimberley they're actually, you know, building something that will have a lasting impact on our planet and maybe help alleviate some of the climate change that is occurring. Here in Kelowna it's utterly ridiculous and so superficial they spend $800,000 for a washroom. Just think of the number of jobs that that would create. But then again, it's all about being superficial and being able to sell your butt on the street corner of the internet as far as City Hall is concerned. However, there are some politicians out there who are real leaders. Yes, real leaders. Uruguay's got one, and we've got a clip on it. Check it out. Uruguay's president, Jose Pepe Mujica, is a former guerrilla fighter inspired by the Cuban Revolution who spent 14 years in prison. But his time spent behind bars didn't deter him from continuing to organize with activists and later rising to power in 2010. What he's done in his short time as president should put the world on notice for what real leadership looks like. See, this week, the 78-year-old, known as the world's poorest president, opened the doors of his own home to Syrian orphans. That's right. Up to 100 Syrian children displaced by the civil war will be arriving in Uruguay as soon as September. And according to the AP, Mujica said the orphans could be housed at first at the presidency's summer retreat, a mansion and riverfront estate surrounded by rolling pastures. And unsurprisingly, the UN is welcoming this announcement, considering how, according to the organization's own estimates, there are currently more than 2 million Syrian refugees. But the president's latest generosity is only consistent with his record of amazing charitable work. In fact, just last week, it was announced that Uruguay would also be accepting five Guantanamo detainees as refugees. But what got Mujica a nomination for a Nobel Peace Prize was him standing up to the ridiculous and failed war on drugs. See, last December, Uruguay became the first country in the world to entirely legalize marijuana. It's a bold move that the Dutch NGO Drugs Peace Institute called a symbol of a hand outstretched of a new era in a divided world. So quick recap here. Mojica's rescuing Syrian refugees, providing humane conditions for Gitmo detainees, and has legalized marijuana. But he also donates 90% of his presidential salary to charity so that he can take home the same wage as an average Uruguayan. <laughs> yep, it sounds like leaders everywhere should be taking a page from Mojica's book. Because in a world where political leaders are almost always comprised of the global elite, Mojica breaks the mold of our suit-clad oligarchy. Really makes you wonder why Mujica wasn't the first pope from the global south. Oh, right. He's also an atheist. Wow. So he's giving up his salary, he's giving up his home, yeah. he's taking in refugees, and he legalized marijuana. 
major thumbs up for that one. Of course, we've got a bunch of conservative wackos around here who say that, no, no, this will just be a gateway drug. Of course, their gateway drug be media or being, yeah, propaganda, media, greed, and of course, McDonald's. You have to wonder how long until the CIA instigates a coup in Uruguay. <laughs> I know, I didn't even see that coming. Okay, what's happening? Activism is, activism is winning. Fascism is losing. And there's, here's an example of what you can do in your community just to be doing something. The future can be what we want it to be. We are brilliant, imaginative and bold. But there are limits. Limits to the amount of carbon dioxide our climate can handle, to the amount of energy available to us, and to the degree to which economic growth is still possible. I believe we need to apply our brilliance to designing within those limits, and we can do it. Around the world, people are already seeing these limits as opportunities. They aren't waiting for permission. They're coming together to create stronger and happier communities, more resilient and vibrant economies, and taking a power back at the same time. It's the power of just doing stuff, and I think it's one of the big ideas of our time. It's about getting on and doing stuff, here, now, today. Visionary, practical, meaningful stuff. You can start small, but visible, and it can grow. In Kilburn, London, a local group have created the first edible garden on an underground station. In Slowit, in Yorkshire, the community rescued the local greengrocers, creating a catalyst for the economic regeneration of the town. In Fujino, Japan, they created their own electric company, which has since inspired another 40 communities across Japan to do the same thing. In Bristol, in the southwest of England, they've set up their own complementary currency, the Bristol Pound, which can be spent in hundreds of local independent businesses. The city's mayor even takes his full salary in. All of this can be done anywhere. When enough places do it, it starts to change our sense of what's possible. So, once again, activism, activism is winning, they get a 10, fascism is losing, they get a zero. People around the world are doing everything from planting community, edible gardens, to creating their own solar power, to helping their communities uh, with uh, alternate currency. Yeah, and, and doing some real things. And it's a real positive impact it's having on the world. And of course, it is being naysayed by major media. I'm Darren Howard. And I'm Robert Nisbet. We're talking about more solutions, more positivity, and more of the ways that you can make change within your own community. We're talking about coming up with a major uh, uh, ruling on the, the native side. On the Supreme Court of Canada. It's crazy, okay? And also talking about homeless people and a billionaire on the right side of history. Be back with part two right after this. AHEAD, Action on Health, Employment, Education and Disability is a partnership of Aberdeen Foyer, a Grampian Housing Association and North East Scotland Credit Union and ourselves Community Food Initiatives North East. We have somewhere around about 100 community food outlets in the North East here. They largely open for a couple hours a week in church halls, sheltered housing and so on and offer fruit and veg. What we want to do is open up our services to a much larger group of vulnerable and disadvantaged people in the North East here and have a wider range of products available. In addition to what we would offer ourselves through the shop is, of course our other partner services would be available, so credit union membership, money advice, uh, tenancies, the range of services they provide would be made available to our customers. Volunteers are the backbone of our organisation and, for example, the credit unions. I've been volunteering for seven years. I suffer from depression, so it's happy if I could come in here and speak to the customers. I have learning difficulties, uh, which made me feel like I wasn't capable for working. Volunteering gave me the confidence and gave me the courage to keep on going. And basically, I managed to get somewhere I never thought I'd be. We have at the moment between 80 and 100 volunteers and we want to double and more that number. 
If we were to be successful in getting the People's Postcode Lottery Dream funding, what it would do is bring our partnership alive and what it would mean is thousands of vulnerable and disadvantaged families and communities would benefit from the range of services our partnership offers.